A privilege and a pleasure to be inviting up on stage the presenter for the session, former CEO of the Investment Board of Nepal, Mr. Radesh Pant. May we request Mr. Pant to kindly grace us on stage. And now I turn to the name of the uh, distinguished speakers, namely IBN board member, Ms. Bhawani Rana. A pleasure to humbly invite her to grace us on stage. Uh, we have Vice President, Public Affairs, Communications and Sustainability for India and South West Asia from Coca-Cola, Ms. Devyani Rajalakshmi Rana. Pleased to welcome CEO of SAP DC, Mr. Arun Dhiman. A pleasure to invite upon stage managing director at the Sino Hydro Sagarmatha Pal Company, Mr. Ho Zhong. Mr. Ho Zhong, MD at Unilever Nepal, Mr. Amlan Mukherjee. From Mogha Energy and Subsidiaries, the United States, Mr. Sam, Samar, Samrath Mogha. And last but not the least, the Director General of FNCCI, Mr. Gokarna Avasti. Indeed, we are so, so pleased to bring, uh, introduce to you our host of distinguished speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire object for this plenary is to give you a comprehensive overview view of Nepal's investment climate and especially highlighting the key sectors and opportunity for international investors. Having said that, it's my pleasure and a privilege to hand over the session uh, now to the session chair, the Chief Secretary of the Government of Nepal, Dr. Baikunta Aryal. Thank you. Is it audible? Can you hear me? Can we receive some technical yeah. help, please? OK, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Shivani. As Shivani told, this is the session about the success stories that the investors who have invested in Nepal are lined up over here. So they will be telling you their story, how they have been successful in investing in Nepal. But before that, setting the tone and setting the environment, I'd like to request Mr. Radhis Panther to give a brief presentation about the investment climate over here. Mr. Radhesh Panta is the former CEO of the IBN Nepal. Before that, he was a banker, successful banker. Now the floor is yours, Radhesh. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chief Secretary, uh, Mr. Chairman, dignitaries, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, all the other speakers are going to talk about their stories, and I'm also here actually to talk about story. Uh, I'm going to talk, talk about basically on investment board, because one of the things that, you know, that I think investors are looking for is confidence and trust in the overall system, and that is the primary criteria why investment board was established in the year 2011. If you want to go back why it was established, because at that point in time, I think the new constitution was due. The political parties had made, had decided that, you know, we need a high-powered uh, institution headed by the prime minister that is going to be like a commercial face for the government of Nepal. It's going to be transparent. It's going to have no political, it's going to be non-political, and it's going to really deal with large-scale projects. And, that's when, uh, at the end of 2011, that was the time when I first joined. And we've been around for about 13 years. And our main uh, objective is to promote Nepal uh, as a destination, then focus on more infrastructure transformative projects, and of course provide one window services. I have to tell you, it's not there yet, one window services, but we have really gone far. The, the investment board has gone far. And also, PPP Excellence, Center for Excellence. Now, you know, what I'd like to do first is just compare investment board with other board of investments. I, it's, uh, just to be fair on the investment board, because, you know, getting investment is not easy. At all levels, at the you know, government level, political level, private sector level, 
public private dialogue at every level you got to understand what projects are and you got to be able, uh, you know prepare yourself for that right so it takes a long time the gestation is quite long so if you look at uh, bangladesh and nepal you know these uh, these countries had investment board in their late 70s and 80s and what we see now is that now they are actually you know moving forward with billions they they have reached billions for Nepal, which started only in 2011, you can see that the, if you look at the five-year average USD, uh, just you know, uh, trend, uh, smoothing the data, the invest, uh, after 2011, after the investment board has uh, been established, the things have taken a positive role and the, and the investment have gone up. So basically, all this is an evolution and we need to adapt to your requirements, the investor's requirement, and with innovation, like currently, for example, you know, with digitalization and all, investment board is doing its best to make sure the aftercare and uh, invest, uh, investor services are really at par. And finally, it requires full commitment of all the stakeholders. By that, I mean, you know, at the political level, bureaucratic level, at the private sector level, and even between the DFIs, there has to be developing financial institution, there, there has to be coordination and so forth. So, uh, okay, I missed one, I think, uh, one point here was, if you look at, you know, in 1990, uh, investment in Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh was pretty much at par. But uh, look at where we are right now. So, you know, investment board does add value. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Now, uh, what has investment board done so far? To be honest with you, I think investment board, again, it has allowed people to think about the public-private uh, projects, understanding about investments. That's what it's been doing within the country and outside of the country. It has formulated two PDAs and few PIAs. These are bankable concession agreements that you know, in the future, all the projects are going to uh, have. And then you have also created, you know, partnership model between public and private sector. Digitalization is used, digitization is used. And, and more than that, you know, over 2.5 billion investments have, uh, been, uh, have, be, have, have been there in Nepal and over 30 projects are in pipeline. Now, Let's talk about some of the uh, some of the these projects. I mean, some some of the uh, representative of these companies are here, but just focusing on various sectors, you know, the value that it has given Nepal. Let's say, for example, energy sector, the Arunthi project, the construction of that, the Upper Trishuli that's going to happen, Upper Karnali hopefully will happen, and Lower Arun. Because of the PDAs, the global compliance, the IFC's uh, you know best uh, standards of the world, the export readiness of these projects, cross-border power, power trading, I think there's at very high levels, you know, we are now going to be able to export to India the 10,000 megawatt that, we're, that the countries are arguing, upon, uh, arguing upon. The by trilateral trade, uh, not only India, we'd probably end up exporting in, in, uh, in uh, Bangladesh. And on the construction side, after the uh, after these Huazin and Hongxi were established, actually the construction costs have really reduced. The cement costs have gone down. The quality has en been enhanced, and then there's ex export capacity as well. And ICT, if, if we think about it, if we look at NCL and F F1 software, with them, you know, the, the services are like global standard in Nepal. The pricing are also very, very reasonable. The digital payment growth has happened. And then all throughout the country, there's uh, nationwide access of, of, uh, of these services. And finally, of course, the cashless banking through, you know, through, through your uh, terminals. And then the FMCG group, I see m more of FM FMCG as our uh, speakers today. But you know, these, um, these companies have been around in Nepal for the past 10, 20 years, or even more than that, maybe 30 years. Uh, and they have been doing successfully well. And I think our, one of our ministers mentioned in, in, the, in the morning, the kind of profits that they're, they're making is also excellent. So, you know, 
Look, and uh, looking at this the, with the technology transfer, there's a lot that can be uh, done in Nepal because nothing really that drastic has happened in Nepal so far. So finally, I also want to say, you know, of course, we can talk about good things that the investment board has done in the, in the past, but one of the areas where investment board is going to move really forward is its uh, institutional financial sustainability. I believe just today the president passed, uh, passed this act uh, whereby, you know, it can hire its own professional staff. So that's going to really help. This is the slide. And then, um, and it, it would generate its own revenue. And secondly, also the project pipeline development. Here, I think we are, for large scale projects, we need to actually get investments from DFIs to make sure that these projects have international best practices, uh, climate resilient and sustainable. So that's, that's something that the investment board is pushing on the, on the green finance. Of course, I'm not working at investment board now, but you know, uh, I know it's doing the right thing. And the third, the uh, investor facilitation, uh, the DOI, Department of Industry, has one window right now. Hopefully, the investment board will also be able to make all, the, all its decisions at, at, uh, at the offices. And finally, fostering you know, responsive governance. Uh, I think by, by that, what I mean is that, you know, we talked about it in the, uh, there was talk in the morning also. I mean, people, I mean, every, ev at every level, you know, we are responsible for, uh, for uh, you know, attracting you at the highest political level, at the bureaucratic level, at the you know, local level. I think that's where we need to make sure that we understand well. We need to share ideas. We need to make sure projects are, good projects are selected. We need to make sure good financing occurs. And especially, you know, I always say that uh, uh, for investors to come into Nepal, the government has to do a hate malo. You know, they, literally you are partners with these investors and that has to be go on, go on in, the, in, in the future uh, to ensure stability, pre predictability, and so on. So finally, I'd like to say, you know, IBN is forward bound. Uh, it's, it's going to uh, be there for you. And there are really boundless opportunities for, for you investors in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Radhis. And thank you very much for your very short but comprehensive presentation. And it has uh, definitely set the tone for the, for the discussion. Now I'd like to introduce Ms. Bhavani Rana. She is uh, currently the, she is the member of the Investment Board of Nepal. And she is former president of FNCCI, Federation of Nepalese Chambers of Commerce, Chambers and Commerce of, Chamber of Commerce and <laughs> Industry of Nepal, sorry. And she is not only the former President, but she is the only one lady president so far. So I give her a very big applause. And uh, she is the honorary consul of Tunisia also. And she is engaged in many businesses, including the tourism management and others. She has the vast experiences in all these things. So I would like to request Ms. Bobani to tell about your story, not the only the story about yourself but also the overall environment that the private sector is facing over here. If you wish, you can go there. Otherwise, I can hand you the mic over here. And the time is limited to three to five minutes max. Uh, chair of the session, distinguished uh, speakers and ladies and gentlemen, Firstly, I'm really honored to be invited as a speaker in this session and quote success stories of investment in Nepal in this important uh, Nepal Investment Summit. So on behalf of private sector, I would like to appreciate IBM and also Nepalese government for taking special initiative to organize investment summit in post-COVID scenario and also to energize the local and international investors. Uh, the fast-changing global regional economic scenario, we need to broaden our relation to benefit from opportunity which are rising and also to address new challenges in investment landscape. So Nepal uh, government has given a very high priority for the economic growth and also like uh, we are working very closely the private sector with the government, especially organizing this summit also. 
So before the summit, um, uh, the private sector of Nepal, we had given some suggestion to the government. We went to the prime minister, uh, the chief secretary is here, and then uh, we uh, asked them, we requested that before uh, I mean, uh, organizing this summit, we need to uh, at least, uh, there are uh, 12 acts which really uh, challenges and there are a lot of constraint for not only the local international uh, uh, investors also to invest in Nepal. So uh, I, they uh, recognize our recommendation and request also. So government of Nepal heeded our recommendation and accordingly amended the laws and passed by the cabinet. And then we are very happy to announce that today, this morning only, this uh, act was passed uh, by the president ordinance. So I think it's, uh, we, we should really embrace this moment and go further. Uh, and then private sector, I, we are working very closely with the government, even during the budget, like we have a fiscal budget every year. So uh, our recommendation has been incorporated by the government also. And last year budget, there was a lot, uh, like, um, uh, lot of positive steps where we could bring uh, FDI also. So uh, I think the speakers in the morning also, and then uh, previous session also, they must have, they've um, already explained that the areas of investment in Nepal, we have a very, very high scope, you know, it's a virgin land. So there are sectors, agriculture, agro sector, industry, lot of education, healthcare and all. And why we feel not only like being a private sector from Nepal, you know, like we really feel that Nepal is a place where we want to in invest. And for me also, I want to, personally, I want to expand my business. I want to uh, see the new avenues where I could expand my business and start a business because I think the economy is very resilient because we can quickly recover from any kind of uh, pandemic also or even like we saw so many changes the last 30 years, b b different political changes also and even insurgency, earthquake, but still, you know, like it's very resilient. So that's why it's a very prominent uh, place where we could invest. Our low inflation rate and strong foreign exchange reserves are two important components of the stable economy. Nepal has significant export market. I think we have two neighboring countries where we could really export our stuff. So this is very uh, enticing for us. Our middle class is also growing, indicating an emerging market. So there are a lot of major changes of the laws and acts. Like uh, 15 years back, it was a little difficult in the industry, you know, because we used to have a lot of debates with the uh, laborers also, labor union, trade union and all. But now we have a labor act, which is very, very um, strong and positive uh, for the uh, employers also. So it really feels that uh, now we, uh, like we don't have any strike. And then uh, the relation between the labor and the employers and employees are very uh, conducive. So that is also very promising. Uh, PPD uh, Act is also there, uh, FITA Act for foreign investment, and then uh, there are a lot of examples of Indian industry and other industries who have been here since uh, more than 20 years are doing very well. We'll be hearing from Unilever also, Everest Bank, SBI Bank, even like Dabur also, and then uh, Gurkha Brewery, uh, other uh, uh, banks like Standard Chartered, Ansel, all of them, like they, think, uh, they take back a very, very good uh, dividends every year. Then we have natural resources, which is unexplored. So we are really looking for uh, partners also to explore these uh, natural resources, and then we can convert this into wealth, which can be beneficial for both, even the local investors and the international investors. We have a uh, uh, average is 24 year old, very youth uh, population. They are like uh, a vast ocean of unrealized potential. And energy sector, I think we've already mentioned, Hospitality is also a very promising center, and government is doing a lot uh, in hospitality, se uh, hospitality sector. Our international uh, airport has been modernized as per private sector's request, and two more new uh, international airport. One is in Bhairava, Lumbini Airport, and Pokhara Airport has been established. So this really gives a, a, like a connectivity, not only international, but city to city, uh, even connectivity has started. So I also belong from the uh, tourism sector. I have a hotel. So I'm expanded. I've expanded my hotel because seeing the uh, promising um, scenario of the country and also like starting a resort because due to this connectivity and uh, the infrastructure, which is really gro growing, I think we can have a very good uh, uh, tourism destination for Nepal. Uh, natural resources, we have a different from Himalayas to uh, wildlife to different uh, kind of tourism. 
So that's why I think uh, I'm expanding and still looking uh, to expand in different areas where uh, the government has also given a priority for tax holiday for 10 years. If you go to some of the, uh, like, virgin uh, land, like uh, uh, far west and all, where you could explore different kind of tourism. Another one is digital economy, which is also very, very uh, promising. And I think integration of digital payment system with India and as well as China can tremendously increase the ease of doing business as well as boost tourism and trade sector of Nepal. And recently, the government of Nepal has unveiled the 16th, 5th, uh, 16th of a five-year plan with 40 goals. And starting from mid-July, the plan targets 7.1 economic growth, which is very, uh, uh, I think, which is very positive. And Nepal is also graduating from least development country to developing country, which moved this to the prosperity ladder also. So uh, we need a lot of investment in um, uh, infrastructure sector and manufacturing sector also. I think the Nepalese uh, private sector also looking for the partnership for the joint venture in this sector, uh, which is uh, very uh, in a priority list for the government also. And another very um, promising and attractive uh, thing of Nepal is like government approach. You know, like we could approach the government very easily if we have some problem, like while doing business, like sometimes you have some challenges, some small nitty gritty problems. But we have a very easy access, not only uh, uh, with the bureaucrats, the chief secretary is there, we run to him, uh, even with the secretary, related secretary, ministers, and even the prime minister. And this access is not only for local investors. I think it's for the international uh, investors also. So that is very promising, which you don't get in other countries, I think. And one window system has been established in Ministry of Industry, which is, uh, uh, which is kind of a, a, a mediation center for the uh, private sector and the government. And rep uh, repatriation of the profit by the investors has been simplified by the central bank also. And of course, IBM is very uh, active. Uh, and proactive on identifying the new profitable project and also uh, to facilitate them in every step also. So because of all these things, I think Nepalese investors are very, very encouraged to invest in further many untapped sectors of Nepal. So recently I've also uh, um, started uh, to manufacture the syringe, the health product, syringe and gloves and many more health products because I see the potential in Nepal and slowly maybe we could export. So that's why I think I urge everyone, whoever are here, to come and invest in Nepal because uh, I think it's a virgin uh, country and we all are there. I think private sector from Nepal, like Federation of Nepalese Chamber of Commerce, CNI and other related organizations, as well as IBM uh, and industry ministry, of course the government will be delighted to help you, facilitate you in every step of investment ventured in Nepal. Thank you so much. Thank you, Baba Niji, for highlighting almost all sectors, and thank you very much that uh, you told your own history also, and all the best for your endeavors. Now, I'd like to invite Ms. Deviani Rajalachmi Rana. She is the Vice President of Public Affairs, Communications, and Sustainability at Coca-Cola India and South West Asia. She brings over 28 years of experience in government and corporate office affairs, strategic advocacy, risk management, and CSR. So now floor is yours, Devaniji, and please uh, try to be brief, as, as brief as possible. Good afternoon and namaskar to each and every one of you. I know it's been a long day. I hope you managed to get some lunch and some refreshment. Um, I'd like to start straight away and keep to the time that the Honorable Chief Secretary has told us to keep to. And with that, I'd like to say a very warm welcome to all our distinguished panel. It's wonderful to have you in Nepal. I happen to be from Nepal, so I'm very proud to be a part of this Nepal Investment Summit 2024. And thank you, Nepal Investment Board and the Ministry for inviting me. So, it's a privilege to represent the Coca-Cola company in the Nepal Investment Summit. I don't know if you all know, Coca-Cola as a company has been operating in Nepal for over 50 years. In fact, this is our 51st year. Um, we are obviously very, very committed to the socio-economic progress of Nepal. Um, I wanted to start by sharing a little bit of our story. So we started in 1973, and we are very much a part of the country's social and economic fabric. 
So we are probably one of the biggest FMCG companies along with our counterparts who are here on the panel. Um, we started five decades ago, and as an American company, on, during those days, it was a very bold, bold move because you know, the institutional value change and logistics was not fully developed at that time. But we had confidence in Nepal. And for over five decades, the company has developed a very strong partnership. We have two bottling plants, one in Kathmandu and the other one in Bharatpur. Um, we also have various ways we develop and celebrate you know, our occasions across millions of people in Nepal. Through our drinks, our brands, we've celebrated with families, with national events, creating lasting memories and forging meaningful connections amongst the Nepali people. So we've been investing, just in the last few years, we've invested $80 million. And we will continue to invest. Coca-Cola is among one of the highest taxpayers in the country. We have over 240 distributors, 125,000 retail outlets across the country, and we have direct and indirect employment of more than 6,000 employees. Um, I'd like to explain a little bit about what I mean by that. When you have, as an FMCG company, and my HUL uh, respected colleague is here, he will explain further to you, Every one personnel that we have in our facilities, in our offices, is you know, uh, equivalent to 10 more. Because we have transportation networks, we have supply chain networks, we have our retailer networks, and literally every retailer, when we give the cooler and we do the training, we make them into entrepreneurs, small, medium, big. And that's what we do as manufacturing. So when you manufacture at the FMCG level, you also create work for the blue-collar worker and not just the white-collar worker, which is very, very important in a country like Nepal. Now, Coca-Cola is not just that. It's also a very responsible business. We supported the people of Nepal throughout the times of the 2015 earthquake with our Ferry, Ferry Utnecha Nepal. We also did uh, the projects to stop the spread during COVID. And we have the Coca-Cola Foundation, which is based out of Atlanta. And we, every year, we support many, many projects in terms of sustainable access to water, climate resilience, circular economy, which basically means waste management, and specifically plastic waste management, uh, economic empowerment to not just our retailers, but to women across Nepal. And we respond to disasters, whether it's in Jajarkot or across Nepal. The Coca-Cola Foundation has not just worked with the international NGOs, but with Nepalese NGOs for a very long time. In fact, for the last three years, from 2021 to 23, we were proud to be a partner and sponsor of the Mountain Cleanup Program with the Nepalese Army. We also support the development of Nepal into a developing nation by 2026. Nepal urgently requires foreign investment for the youth demographic and to drive innovation. For companies like ours that are driven by consumption, we are losing talent when our Nepalese go across. So we have to make sure that we have a positive environment where companies like us continue to invest and create employability. This is not, at this point, what I would like to do is to laud the government to say that they've done amazing things, and especially the Nepal Investment Board, to promote investment presently. And this summit is an incredible opportunity for the government to pitch Nepal, not just to the Nepalese and not to just our neighborhood, but across to the international investors. In closing, I and Coca-Cola would like to please thank the organizers for bringing this industry together, and we look forward to supporting a future-ready and prosperous Nepal. Namaskar and dhere dhere dhanyavad. Thank you, Debuenji. Thank you for highlighting the overall story of Coca-Cola in Nepal, how you are doing, and so thank you very much. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Arun Diman. He is the CEO of three hydroelectric projects in Nepal. As his name is Arun, and all these projects are named with Arun also. So, Arun third, that is 900 megawatt install capacity. Arun four, 495 megawatts. And lower Arun, that is 669 megawatts. So all three hydroelectricity projects with him, 
and he has the 32 years of experience of engineering and mostly in the hydro hydropower. So, so Arun, please be brief in your yeah, presentation. Yeah. And I would like to thank Devanji for completing your presentation in five minutes. So I'd like to <laughs> say, <laughs> request the same to Arunji. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, respected sir. Uh, good evening to everyone who is present here. Uh, like uh, what the uh, chair has told, okay, I'll just tell that there was a success of Arun III. Uh, that is not uh, in a paper or something like that is in practical experience, which you can get it up. Our project has completed almost 74% of the work. In, despite of the pandemic of two years, we started our work in 2018 end. And uh, within a five years, three years time, with, if you deduct from that one, we have achieved the progress of 74%. Yes, uh, in between when we started the work, we had some problems by uh, initially by the miscurrents uh, at the project site, disturbance at the project site. Uh, at that time, our management even if uh, thought of okay, whether we have taken the right decision to go through, go, take up the project or not, or whether we should wind it up or something like that. Uh, but after uh, reaching to the government, at that time, I think Honorable Right Honorable Prime Minister was Mr. Oli. Oli Saab was the Prime Minister. And we approached him, okay, we are a little bit worried about uh, whether we will be able to complete the project or not. And uh, like Ms. Bhavani already told, okay, it is very easy in Nepal to approach the higher, even if the Prime Minister also. I think the way at that time the government of Nepal bounced back and assures us assured the project about the security, safety of the people and that one. And the reason for that one, you can see the progress in three years with 74% of the progress. In that way, I think uh, the government of Nepal is helping out every time, everywhere, where we can get it of the progress and connect with that thing. I think after that one, uh, Mr. Sher Bahadurji was there. We had a problem again because in a home, you definitely have a problem every time. And now Mr. Prachanji, uh, when he joins as a Prime Minister, and uh, when we met him first time, our chairman and that, uh, when we started our uh, telling him the problems of the project which can increase the progress, uh, as a Prime Minister, he took out his diary and note everything on that one. That is the way the uh, government of Nepal works. And we feel uh, very, very highly obliged at that time and that uh, Nepal is ready for the investment and uh, we can believe on that one and after uh, and we can invest uh, in a good manner, in a uh, full-fledged manner in that. And uh, we, we can say that after Arun 3, we, uh, our management, our government, government of India has come up with two more projects. We have, uh, we are ready with the investment for the two more projects. I think Lover Arun will go uh, in a construction in this year only. And uh, I feel that with uh, Bakunji, uh, we always take a time on a phone, I'll always time it, take, sir, we had a problem, a small stint problem here. He called up the meeting and all district officers, all sectaries and, and have it up, keep, let us line it up. The way the government is working for making it investment friendly country, and uh, with OIBN in between, which is a single window system, I think from 2011 uh, to now, in last two, three years that have uh, gone up, had a, uh, always keeping up as a hand holding to us to way through for all ministries in that. Uh, I wish all the good luck for uh, government of Nepal and IBN for this investment summit. And we as an Indian company are ready for more investments in hydrogen sector, uh, which recently has been added to us, and uh, Government of India has given a nodal agency, SJVN, for putting up in a pilot project in hydrogen in uh, Nepal. So we'll be working out firstly on that one. And uh, SJVN is almost a 56 gigawatt company in uh, uh, India, with solar, wind, uh, in hydrogen recently, and hydro. I wish them all the best of luck, and. Uh, uh, assure investors that if you have a will to invest here, so you will get an every help from government of Nepal, even if from OIBN, even if from all the sectors and everything. Thank you. Thank you, Arunji.
for being on time and so keeping the time but short. Thank you very much. Uh, and telling the story about how you were feeling in, in, in Nepal. So thank you very much that you, I mean, the, you had some experience that accessing the bureaucrats and I mean, the sorting out the things from the bureaucracy and the political level. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that one. And that is for the other investors also that we are easy and we try to resolve the problem as, as soon as possible in our capacity. So now I would like to invite Mr. Hao Zhong. He is a skilled electrical engineer from Sichuan University. And he, had the, he also has the extensive experience in the hydroelectricity sector. He currently serves as the managing director of Sino Hydro Sagarmatha Power Company in Nepal, which is overseeing major projects and demonstrating expertise in various managerial roles across China and Nepal. So, Mr. Hao, this, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies uh, and gentlemen, uh, to you, um, to my part uh, English, uh, please uh, allow me to speak uh, Chinese. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to share my experiences with you and my experience in the construction of the Nibir Shui-Tian Hangi. Sankoshi 456兆瓦桑塔马克西水电站 中国方案，中国设备，中国资金，项目位于甘大基省纳木郡地区，是一座金牛饮水式水电站。项目闸坝长一百一十四米，高二十点五米，饮水系统长四点九五公里，厂房为地面式厂房，装有两台，每电容量
、覆盖、规划设计、施工承包、投资运营、装备制造等工程建设全过程的立体业务结构，具有为海内外客户提供全产业链集成。整体解决方案服务的卓越价值创造能力。上面讲的 A 水源站建设运营发挥了集团全产业链管理优势，对进度、安全、质量目标的实现起到了关键作用。二，与当地国家进程合作，项目股东双方进程诚信合作，并与尼泊尔电力局等单位保持良好合作关系。由于项目计划接入的库里变电站建设缓慢，为解决尼泊尔电力紧张。公司投资修建二十公里应急输电线路，临时接入中马乡的电站开关站，避免项目电力无法输出的局面。电站投运以来，尼泊尔电力局在电费支付等方面诚信履约，双方合作良好。三，积极回馈回馈社会，造福当地。项目项公司与当地政府及村民代表共同设立协调委员会，处理当地事务。精心筛选社会责任项目，积极推动当地经济社会发展。运营以来，项目公司共同实施社会责任项目二百余项，投入社会资金超过五千万卢比。自投运以来，为尼泊尔上交国内税费二十一亿卢比。对于尼泊尔水电行业未来的发展，我再次呼吁：一、政府应大力推进跨境电力合作机制。尼泊尔具有丰富的水电资源。地处内陆，具备为周边国家供应清洁能源的潜力。同时，跨境电力合作将进一步提升尼泊尔电网的稳定性。我们建议尼泊尔政府加快与周边国家跨境输电线路的开发与推动，以使尼泊尔电网电量充分供应，发电能力全部得到有效消纳。二、发展能源密集性产业。目前，尼泊尔雨季市场电力已出现过剩。未来几年，电力供过于求的局面将进一步加剧。为解决雨季、旱季发电失衡的问题，尼泊尔政府应规划更多的 PROR 式蓄蓄水式电站，以增强尼泊尔电源的调节能力，并通过加速上述类型电站的 PPA 进度，保障电价等手段，吸引国际投资人。与此同时，政府应引导。工业企业认识尼泊尔电力不足，向能源充足的转变，加快电网系统建设，加快发电电发展电动车、矿产、冶炼等耗能性的产业。三、为水电行业提供政策支持。尼泊尔法律法规逐步健全，为水电行业的良性发展提供了可能。然而，近年来一些法律法规不符合水电行业发展需求。也对外商投资起到了阻碍作用，比比如法律只允许使用不超过百分之五的外籍人员，外籍人员工资允许汇回比例也进一步下降，外籍员工签证年限限制等一直困扰着我们。我们希望政府可以重申、重新审视，为外商投资水电行业提供更多政策支持。四、深化合作共赢理念。为投资者创造更好的运营环境。尼泊尔各部委、政府应加强村民及社会团体的教育和规范管理，避免出现无理诉求、甚至阻攻、干扰项目的正常运营，给尼泊尔国家及投资者造成巨大损失。中国电建将继续做好对尼泊尔市场的研究，以水电开发为核心主业，充分发挥新能源集成能力。争取实现突破，我们将稳妥、健康、持续经营，充分发挥自身的水能城主业优势，与在尼的中尼及第三国企业及合作伙伴紧密合作，继续在尼深入发展，不懈努力促进中尼友好经贸往来。以上是我的发言，感谢各位的聆听，谢谢。Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ao. But uh, anyone uh, interpreting it? Uh, just, Hello. No. Can I have the microphones on, please? Okay. Yeah.
With permission from the chair, may I read out the summary of the yeah. speech? Uh, thank you, sir. Business history of Power Construction Corporation of China, herein referred to as Power China in Nepal, can be traced back to 1969 when its member companies participated in the construction of the Sunkosi Hydropower Station project in Nepal, which was aided by China. At present, Power China has carried out multiple businesses in Nepal, mainly engaged in water conservancy, hydropower, power transmission and transformation, as well as small number of trans transportation, industrial and mining projects. The 456 megawatt Upper Tamakoshi hydropower project constructed by the contractor is the largest installed capacity hydroelectric power station in Nepal. It was put into operation in July 2021 and is known as Nepal's Three Gorges project. Upper Mashangdi A hydroelectric project is jointly invested and constructed by Power Construction Corporation of China and Sagarmatha Power Company Limited. It adopts the boot model and has been awarded for a concession period of 35 years. Years. It completely adopts Chinese technology, Chinese plan, and Chinese equipment, and Chinese fund. The project is located at Lomjung district of Gondaki province. It is a runoff river type hydropower project. The dam of the project is 114 meters and 20.5 meters high. Uh, the powerhouse is in the surface type and equipped by two units with capacity of 20 megawatts each. Approximately 360 gigawatt per hour of annual power generation is transmitted to the power grid. The PPA is signed in December uh, 2010. The generic license is obtained in 2012, and it entered into commercial operation in January 2017. Adhering to the investment philosophy of cohesive diversity for inclusive growth, investment, innovation for sustainable future, Power China Resources Company Limited overcame numerous difficulties like earthquake and border blockade, then successfully completed project development and construction. Upper Marshang, the A hydroelectric project became the first hydropower project invested by a Chinese-funded enterprise in Nepal and was also the largest investment project by a Chinese enterprise at that time. The investment development of the project has served as a model for other Chinese funded enterprises and also provided positive contribution to alleviating the power shortage in Nepal. Since the commercial operation, it has achieved excellent operational performance and has delivered approximately 2.5 billion kilowatt hours of green energy to the INPS. Here, I'd like to share some experiences regarding the successful investment and development of projects. The first is to utilize fully advantages full advantages of the entire industrial chain of Power China Group. In 2023, Power China ranked at 105th among Fortune it ranked first among ENR's 2023 top 150 global design firms, and in addition, it ranked sixth and eighth respectively among ENR's 2023 top 250 uh, global contractors and top 250 international contractors. In the global power construction industry, uh, Power China has always ranked first in terms of capability and performance. By following the principle of integrating industrial chain and diversifying competitive industries, Power China has established a complete business structure, which from the lateral perspective includes a variety of industries like energy and power, water resources, environment, infrastructures, real estate development, and so forth. It covers the whole engineering construction process involving planning, programming, construction contracting, investment and operation, equipment, uh, manufacturing, etc. The complete uh, business structure enables Power China to be well valued in providing a complete industrial service and creating integrated solution. The construction and operation of uh, Upper Marshangdi A hydroelectric project exerted advantages of the full industry chain management, which played a key role in achieving progress, safety and quality goals. The second is to have a sincere cooperation with various local sectors. Both shareholders of the project cooperate in good faith and maintain good cooperative relationships with the Nepal Electricity Authority and other units. Due to slow construction of the Kuri substation planned to be connected to the project, in order to solve the power shortage in Nepal, the company invested in the construction of a 20-kilometer emergency transmission line and temporarily connected it to the switch station of the Middle Marshangdi power station to avoid the situation where the project's electricity cannot be output. 
Since the Upper Moshang, the A power station was put into operation, the NEA has fulfilled its obligations with integrity in terms of electricity payment and other aspects, and both parties have cooperated well. The third is to actively give back to the society and benefit from the local area. The company, together with the local government, villager representatives, established a concern and support committee to handle local affairs. We carefully select corporate social responsibility projects and actively promote economic and social development of locals. Since the operation period, the project company has implemented more than 200 social responsibility projects, invested more than 50 million rupees in social responsibility funds, and has paid 210 million rupees in various taxes and fees for Nepal since its operation. Regarding the future development of hydropower industry of Nepal, I hereby appeal that, firstly, the government should vigorously promote the cross-border power co cooperation mechanism. At the same time, cross-border power cooperation uh, will further enhance the stability of Nepal's power grid. Secondly, energy-intensive industries should be promoted. Currently, there is a surplus electricity in Nepal during rainy season, and the oversupply of electricity will further intensify in the next few years. To address the issue of power imbalance between the rainy and dry seasons, the Nepalese government should plan for more run of the river and pondage and reservoir type hydropower stations to enhance Nepal's power grid regulation capacity. Thirdly, supportive policies for the hydropower industry should be implemented. Laws and regulations of Nepal are gradually improving, making it possible for the healthy development of hydropower industry. However, in recent years, some laws and regulations have not met the development needs of the hydropower industry and have also hindered foreign investment. Fourthly, we hope the concept of win-win cooperation can be deepened and a more friendly business environment for investors can be created. The government of Nepal, from the federal to the local level and various ministries, should strengthen the education and standardized management of villages and communities to avoid unreasonable demands even obstructing work, which leads to the normal operation of uh, projects being interfered and will cause huge losses to the Nepalese country and investors. Power China will continue to conduct through a thorough research on the Nepalese market with hydropower development as its core business. We fully leverage our capabilities in integrating new energy sources and strive for breakthroughs. We will operate steadily, healthily and sustainably, making full use of our advantages in the water, energy and urban sectors. We will work closely with Chinese, Nepalese and third country enterprises and partners in Nepal, continuing to deepen our our development in Nepal and making unremitting efforts to promote friendly economic and trade exchanges between China and Nepal. Thank you for listening to my speech. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Shivani, for uh, interpreting what Mr. Howe presented. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Amlan Mukherjee, I'm moving from hydropower to some other sector now, and he is the MD and CEO of Unilever Nepal Limited, and he has very vast experience, actually 30 years of experience in industry experience in general management, brand management, and sales and marketing. So, and uh, currently he is the MD and CEO of Unilever Nepal Limited since April 2020. Now may I request you to make a brief presentation and I'd like to request you for completing your Don't presentation worry, within five minutes. Thank you very much. Don't worry, I'll try and close it in five minutes. Honorable Chief Secretary, uh, my fellow panelists, uh, the investors sitting in this room and the future investors, I stand here on behalf of Unilever, a 60 billion euro company globally, which operates in 108 countries globally. Now, why, do, why did I name 108 countries? It is because of the fact that not in all 108 countries we produce. In some of the countries, we source through neighboring countries. But in Nepal, we produce 
and we produce for the last 30 years and we plan to produce, you pl we plan to manufacture for the next 70, if not more. Now, how do we do it? If we look at, we define an opportunity of a market mostly in four parameters, market size, white space to grow, regulations, and industrial relationship. I'll give you the, a perspective of the market size. All of us, we know that Nepal is a 30 million, uh, around 30 million in terms of population. If I tell you that Malaysia has nearly 30 million of population, if I tell you Ukraine has nearly 30 million population, if I tell you Canada has around 35 million of population, does it change a bit of your perspective? Does it give you the market size and the future opportunity of this land? That there are that many consumers who are present over there and it is important to grow the market, to grow the GDP, so that these con consumers, they have the ability to purchase and which will ultimately lead to growth. That is how we define this market and we say that this market has a huge headroom in terms of growth. Regulations, lots have been spoken from the morning. I'll just give one uh, point. For the last three years I'm here on certain issues I've engaged with the government of Nepal a number of times, multiple times. Last week, a f ordinance has been passed and today this has been made legalized. A number of our requests has been accept accepted by government of Nepal. And for the manufacturing industry, it is very, very important request, right? So if I, I am optimistic out of it, I leave it to you. And the last but not the least, the industrial relationship. Since 2021, I am here. We haven't lost. We have a huge factory. We have a really huge factory in Hitoda. We haven't lost one mandate in the last three and a half years. That is what the industrial relationship stands for. Now, this is about Nepal. I think in my left two and a half minutes, I should talk about a bit about Unilever Nepal also. We started with one SKU. Some of you may know it was called Will. And today, we make 150 products in Nepal. We pay directly and indirectly almost 300 crores of tax to the Nepal exchequer. We have started the journey. Today our share price in Nepal, in terms of the investors who have trusted us, is almost 300 USD. Today our market cap in Nepal is 275 million USD, right? Now, if this is not an example of success, then what it will be? And it is not the example of Unilever success. Sorry. This is an example of Nepal success. Today, if you have opened the newspaper, most of the newspaper which is worth, the only line which you have put in, and those newspapers are, I think, in your packet, you can take it out, is that if we can, you can. Right? So that's our approach. I'll, t I'll speak about only two part of our operations. One is Unilever is a marketing company. We take a pride that if not the best, we are amongst the best marketeers in the world. Those marketing best practices we have got in Nepal. Today, the Nepal-made advertisement is being played in different countries. Today, the Nepal-made activation is being mentioned in Kantar. If you know, some of you may not know about Kantar. It is the largest uh, market research agency in the world in their annual report as an example of activation. And that activation was entirely made in Nepal during the Dasai time, which is the local festival that speaks about our invol involvement with the local aid. The second thing which I'll speak about is about, we heard a lot about digital. When we talk about e-commerce, mostly we talk about B2C, 
business to consumers. There is a huge e-commerce which is B2B, business to business. Unilever Nepal has created a B2B platform which is called Shikhar. We cover 50,000 outlets in Nepal, much less than Devyani, but sorry, only that many outlets keep soaps. Uh, but in those outlets, those outlets are tagged, GPS tagged. So every outlet is tagged in GPS. And 18,000 of that 50,000 outlets also deal with us through our app called Shikhar and place order which goes to the distributor and the distributor services within 48 hours. Now, why, have I, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because if we can, lots can. The e-com in Nepal has unending opportunity. To end my uh, point, we are a responsible organization. Our plastic footprint is huge. I'm sure all of you know. We take back 100% of the plastic which we generate in Nepal. We take back the same quantity and more from the environment. And 60% of plastic we reprocess and reuse in different forms. 90% of the energy which we use in our factory is clean energy. So hence, as because we are working in Nepal, we never compromise on the Unilever standard of operation which we follow in the rest of the countries. Nepal deserves the best. We try to deserve and give the best. I don't know how much we are successful. I end by saying, if we can, you can. Thank you so much. So now I'd like to invite Mr. Samrat Moga. He is the president of Moga Energy. He is a visionary leader known for impactful investments in green energy. He has the decade long experience and he spread area projects like Liku 1, 2, and A, adding 161 megawatt to Nepalese grid. Now, may I also request you to please honor the time? Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Honorable Chief Secretary, distinguished panelists, um, and the gentlemen in this room for having me today. Samrat Moga, 30, an engineer from New York. Many people have a reason to be fascinated with Nepal, some due to Mount Everest, some due to the beautiful valleys and the flowing rivers, and some due to the greenery. Mine comes from heritage. I was born to an Indian American father and a Nepali mother about some 30 years ago. I have been witnessing Nepal from my childhood and seeing the gap in development, the gap in the standard of living, coming here for a month uh, out of the 12 in a year. So when I was 16, I found out about the possibilities in the energy sector in Nepal, though I mean, I, I know this seems like a very young age, but th this is true. I, I, I found out about the possibilities in the energy sector, and I went to college determined uh, to become an engineer um, in the renewable space, um, uh, because I could see myself coming back here and hopefully generating a few megawatts of electricity. Um, and, and that's what happened. Um, in 2016, I formed Moga Energy um, right after graduating when I was 22. And um, I came to Nepal to understand what the market was like, what the investments here were like. Um, and through our local partners, MV Dugar Group, we decided in 2018 to invest into Liku 1, Liku 2, and Liku A hydroelectric projects. We have not come a long way since then. From a one day drive and a two day trek, to reach our site, we can do it now in eight hours. From dark villages, we've seen enlightened, uh, from dark nights, we've seen enlightened villages. And from barren landscapes, we've seen what I would well call pretty powerhouses. We have just commissioned our last project of uh, Liku 177. Now we have 161.4 megawatts of commissioned energy assets connected to the Nepalese grid. While building our projects from day one, we've always had an approach 
of being different. We've used the best consultants in the industry. We've, been, we've used the most advanced equipment, um, taking our electromechanical equipment from Andres. Not only that, we are the only power plant in Nepal which has the capacity to be operated without a single person, completely manless and automated uh, capacity is inbuilt into our power plant. Not only this, we have also used the most advanced methods of construction, um, whether that be using the most uh, reliable tunneling equipment, the highest safety standards, the most experienced of contractors, and it has allowed us to set many records, one of which is the fasting, fastest tunnel construction in one month period. We have done this with our formidable and skilled team in the country, and all of this has resulted, us, resulted in us producing um, very high, highly reliable power plants at a good cost, um, generating more than 98% of the planned energy. Now, we are not only providing clean and green energy to the Nepalese grid. We believe that the hydropower story goes much further than that. If you look at the impact our projects have, we've constructed 110 kilometers of road. By constructing the road, I've not only gotten probably a little heavier, but more so, this means that the people, the roughly 40 to 50,000 people that live along that road can now reach Kathmandu in about eight hours as opposed to three days. This means that doctors and teachers which were not ready to walk three days to work somewhere are now looking for opportunity in that area. This means that when a project is constructed, a hospital is built, which is not only available to the local, to our manpower, but also to the local community. Not only do, do we provide, does this help in emergency, but this directly affects the cost of living. Prior to this, a person would have to walk two days to get a bag of rice. Now it's available at their local shop. Furthermore, due to the construction of the projects, a local transmission line and a local grid is built much before the projects are commissioned. This brings light to every single household much before the light from our own powerhouses are produced. In addition, the provision of having 10% local populace holding at a par value, which means 10% of our shares uh, at the time of IPO will be held by the local communities, means that the wealth creation in which we are also gaining, that means that every single local person in that area is also gaining directly and economically um, in their bank account. Finally, when these projects are built, uh, they have provided indirect and direct employment for nearly 5,000 people. Some of these people have been working in the GCC countries for 5, 10, 15 years with no hope of moving back and have seen their home maybe after a decade having uh, uh, equivalent salaries considering inflation higher than what they were receiving outside the country. Some of these people have worked for the first time in a project, developing skills which will then be used and transferred to other people in the country as well. Finally, every single hydropower project comes with CSR activities. As per the current government mandate, 0.75% of the cost of any project should be used for CSR-related activities. What this means, if we look at the broader scheme of things, is that to develop 10,000 megawatts over the next seven to eight years, which is the government's plan, we need to have, uh, that would induce a spending of almost $150 million on community support programs, and indirectly, five to 10% of every project's cost is infrastructure development. So that's one and a half to two billion dollars in infrastructure development, which is, which is the type of impact for which grant aid money is required, which can happen through the private sector just through investment. There are always challenges uh, when developing any type of project in, in the Hindu Kush whether that is uh, geological, whether that be technical, whether that be uh, social. But the government has always stood with us in helping us overcome these issues, and the result of which are these commissioned assets, 
without the government support, without the local government support, and without the local people support, it is absolutely impossible to do these projects. So I think by executing these projects, you can understand that what type of investment climate Nepal actually has to offer the world. Now, of course, we are very, very optimistic. I, 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 would, I would go on to say we are very, very bullish about Nepal. With the continued support of the government and of our neighbors and our energy offtake, uh, nothing can stop Nepal from becoming the green battery of Southeast Asia. Not only does Nepal have the ability to generate electricity, which is important, it also has the ability to store electricity because of its very topography. This could allow a green stabilizing force to the grids of our neighbors. And lastly, I would like to mention that with these assets now commissioned, uh, MOGA Energy is putting our money where our mouth is. We are launching a infrastructure fund and uh, by the name of MOGA InfraBlocks Fund, and we are investing a further $100 million over the next three years into the renewable energy sector in Nepal. In addition to this, MOGA Energy has done a tie-up with Tata Power through an FDI investment in Dugar Power, and we are looking at developing 100 megawatts of rooftop solar over the next five years so that everybody in the country, not just people next to the grid, have access to clean energy. In addition to this, we are also looking at using solar to balance the country's peak and off-peak load issues so that even in the winter, an import requirement severely reduces uh, from where it is currently. Very simply, our plan is very ambitious. We hope to produce 1,000 megawatts in the next five years. It's taken us about eight to get to 161, but I think it's something that we can definitely achieve. And finally, we are also looking to bring this energy to every last consumer in the country. For that, we are working with Static to see how we could develop an EV charging network in the country. So these are only to demonstrate that if we can do it, as our, gen our friend from Unilever said, you can too. I would like to thank um, IBN for having me here today. I would also like to thank my mentor, specifically my grandfather, Mr. Modi Laudugar, for teaching me. And I would also like to uh, thank the government of Nepal, as well as the team of the IBN for inviting me here. I would like to end with an anecdote. Why do we do this at MOGA? A friend of mine asked me a year ago, we were in Pokhara, you know, you're going to end up commissioning your, your last project. Why are you doing this? What's the purpose? What's the end goal? And I, and I thought about it for just about a second, and I said, I wish I see the mountains every day from Kathmandu. I used to come here when I was young, and every single time, even in the monsoon, we would get to see the mountains every single day. But with global warming, with the climate where it is currently, that's not the case. So for us, our goal is very simple. We are investing in Nepal so that our children, my grandchildren, can see the mountains every day. And we urge you to invest in Nepal so that you could, your grandchildren could do the same. Thank you for having me here today uh, and giving me the time to speak. Thank you, Samba. Thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. And thank you very much for highlighting all the successes that you have and all the support that you have been getting. And thank you very much for highlighting your plans also. So all the best for your plans, the future plans. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to invite Mr. Gokran Avasti. He, he is currently serving as the Director General of FNCCI, the young, young gentleman. And he also has some, some different hats also. He was the previous journalist and he is also involved in the academia, and now he is the Director General of FNCCI. So, Mr. Obasti, I would like to request you, because uh, all, all the presenters here, they said about their stories. Now, you tell about the overall industrialists in Nepal, how they are facing and how they are familiar with. So, but the time limit is the same. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Chief Secretary, uh, distinguished panelists, and participants. Namaste. On behalf of Federation of Nepali Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I would like to welcome all the participants to the third Nepal Investment Summit. When we speak about Nepal, we often think our country is small, but we are actually quite a large market. That is because we are between India and China, we think so. 
When we take population into consideration, Nepal is actually the 49th largest country in the world. In the last 25 years, around 4 million Nepalese have risen from the poverty line. 4 million people coming out from the poverty line means that the number of consumers in the Nepali market has also increased. And this could be the reason why the majority of the multinational companies operating in Nepal are performing well. The story of the multinational companies in Nepal is largely successful. As FNCCI is also the employer's council, we can say that the complaints related to labor issues have dropped. Our products are getting duty-free market access in India, China, and other developing, developed countries. Now we are graduating to the League of Developing Nations in 2026. Even after Nepal graduates to a developing nation in 2026, we will still able to avail duty-free facility in some, some developed nations till 2029. Due to Indo-Nepal trade treaty, preferential market access will remain in India. The Middle East is another potential market for Nepali exports. On an average, there are more than 10 flights on a daily basis from Kathmandu to the Middle East. It helps us to export our agro products, bottled water, and other products smoothly to GCC. It means you produce here and export across the world with preferential access. Along with the export of goods, we need to start focusing on export of services too, which is rapidly growing throughout the world. Thousands of Indian nationals visit our border, border towns for medical treatment. If we could improve medical infrastructure and technical institutions in our hill stations, the number of South Asian and other nationals coming for treatment and education could rise significantly. Religious and adventurous tourism is always there. We have already talked much about potential of IT and hydropower. In a major breakthrough, Nepali cement companies have also started exporting their products to India. Government has amended two well investment related laws and regulations to facilitate foreign and domestic investors. Moreover, the framework of the bilateral investment agreement has also been passed from the cabinet. The foreign exchange reserves that we have at present are sufficient to cover imports of two well months. We now have to focus on how we can create and increase demand in the market. The world outside is a huge market awaiting to be tapped. We need to grab this opportunity. We want to provide our foreign investors with the best investment climate that we can. FNCCI organized business and investment summits in India, China, and Dubai, respectively, in the last year. That is our effort to attract foreign investment and increase exports. We are open to organize such events with other countries, and I request the participant chambers and other participants that we will come to your country for events, and we also welcome you for different events in Nepal. We at FNCCI also have an FDI help desk that at our secretariat. The help desk was established to provide assistance to foreign investors. If any investor requires any help regarding any investment policy or procedure, please feel free to approach to us. We will be more than happy to assist you. Thank you, and I wish all the participants have a fruitful two days at the summit. Thank you. Thank you, Gokarna. Thank you very much. Thank you for highlighting the things and also informing the floor that I mean, the, what FNCCI offers for the FDIs and so. So I have been told by the organizers that time is running out, and exactly it is running out because this session was supposed to complete at 4 o'clock, but we started at 4.15, so I must conclude this session. And let me go to the podium so that I, mean, I can see everyone's face over there. Okay, distinguished uh, panelists, distinguished participants over here. Thank you very much for your patience that you are still here with your cheerful faces and so. Today, in this session, we heard varieties of experiences, not only from the 
domestic investors, but also from the external investors. I, I would like to thank you very much for the presenters, for your inspiring and encouraging statements, and some were very powerful investments too. And you were encouraging the investors sitting around in, in this hall to invest in Nepal and to convince them that your investment would not be a waste in Nepal. So thank you very much for the, the, that powerful statement. And so this session was actually designed to tell the stories by the investors themselves. Because what we thought that the private inv investors like you understand the issues when themselves speak. And when we talk about the regulations, when we talk about the procedures and everything, and then you would sometimes, okay, be confused whether that is true or whether that is only in paper or whether that is in the practice and so. Now, the investors themselves are telling their stories that their investments were the success in Nepal. So, that compels you to believe the things, right? So, you can also invest in Nepal and make the benefits. And thank you very much for your, again, your stories, the panelists. And thank you for choosing Nepal for your investment. And I truly believe that you are highly satisfied investing in Nepal. Also, I hope that you will scale up your investments in the coming days, not only in the sectors that you are investing in now, but in the multiple sectors in the future also. As we have heard in the morning session and in the afternoon sessions also, there are varieties of reform measures that the government has taken. The one and foremost very important legal reforms that happened today when the Right Honorable President issued the ordinance amending some laws that are relating to the investment facilitation. They are related with the land, land acquisition, forest, national parks, industrial enterprises, foreign investment and technology transfers, and PPP that enables the IBN to be strengthened in the future and so. So these are the only, only the beginning of the amending some of the laws that are somehow obstacles to you. And there are many more in the pipeline. So we will be continuously working on easing the environment over here, not only in the legal terms, but also in the procedural terms. As uh, Right Honorable Prime Minister in the morning session said that, uh, we have two agencies, one is IBN, Investment Board of Nepal, and another one is the Department of Industry. Both have the one-stop services to you. And they are very much committed to each the procedures. And we will be making the these procedural reforms in the coming days. And also, the Right Honorable Prime Minister also informed that the government of Nepal has recently uh, approved the model framework for the BIA, Bilateral Investment Agreement, which enables you to sign, I mean, the, if any, any friendly country signs the agreement with us, then your investment is protected and your investment would be promoted over here. So I also echo the same that Right Honorable Prime Minister said in the morning that I would like to encourage all of you to sign the BIA with us so that you, any of your investors from any country would be protected over here. And the repatriation is quite easy and everything is easy and so. So I don't need to uh, spend much time over here because you have heard from the horse's mouth. So I don't need to tell that, okay, well, this is the environment that the people are getting benefits from here, investing in here and so. Because they, they told themselves and they told their stories and you listen to them. So I would like to in, invite all of you to invest in Nepal. And if you have any problems, then you can approach us to the government, to the government agencies and we are always to facilitate you. With this small note, I'd like to thank all the participants very much for, for your patience over here, and I'd like to once again thank the presenters for their presentations. Thank you very much. So big applause to the presenters. That, that they really, I hope that they really encouraged you to make your investment in Nepal. With this, 
I would like to conclude this session also. Thank you. Thank you very much. And immense thanks on behalf of the organizers to all the distinguished members in the panel. And as we uh, head towards the very concluding moments, we take a moment to extend our bit of appreciation for the valuable time that you've extended and such insightful, encouraging and inspiring stories that you bring to this forum, which only adds so much value and so many takeaways for many, many uh, individuals here in. Uh, in the interest of time, we could not open the floor for the questions. However, given the availability of our distinguished speakers, please feel free to connect to them and then have, uh, a, have the opportunity of knowing more and exchanging and, and, and you know, fostering more sharing. Uh, said that uh, to extend the... Uh, uh, appreciation and gratitude on behalf of the organizers. May I invite upon stage the uh, Joint Secretary at the Office of the Investment Board of Nepal, Mr. Pradyumna Upadhyaya, for presenting this token of appreciation to the Session Chair, Chief Secretary of the Government of Nepal, Dr. Baikunta Adyal. Panelists to kindly take center stage for a quick group photo opportunity. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, one last round of applause to our esteemed members of the panel. A panel which featured the real life examples of successful investment ventures, which we believe was very, very instrumental in providing you all with valuable insights and inspiration. Thank you for being great members of the audience. And one last gratis, uh, gesture of gratitude to the esteemed members in the panel. With this, we have concluded this second plenary session of the day. And right away, we move to uh, the other engagement of the day, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm sure you are very, very much looking forward to this uh, particular uh, session, which is uh, all about project showcasing for expression of interest. The presentation title is Project Spotlight, uh, Igniting Interest Through Engaging Expression of Interest interest. May I request the members from the organizing committee and volunteers to see that the stage is set for the next set of panelists to take over on the stage. And as we do uh, get the stage set, uh, let me uh, apprise you all that over the next one hour, we shall delve into the prospects and practicalities aimed at uh, helping you understand our vision, the state of affairs, procedures and technicalities and the investment climate here in Nepal. And in view of the huge potential Nepal holds by virtue of its resources, need, burgeoning markets in the neighborhood uh, and a host of other factors, ladies and gentlemen, the prospects of doing business in Nepal is huge. And as you all know, the government has showcased 150 plus projects of which 21 are ready to go projects, inviting potential buyers to submit expression of interest. This session furnishes the necessary information for the clarity of your understanding. And uh, if I may request all the panelists to take their seats in the very front row in the member of the audience. May I invite all the uh, panelists for this session to kindly grace the front row for a bit as we get the stage set. We request all our esteemed participants, delegates and uh, invitees to kindly take your respective seats as we are now looking forward to begin the session on project showcasing for expression of interest. Please join me, ladies and gentlemen, in inviting the panelists for the session. First and foremost, Mr. Akshit Raj Paudel, MSc in Industrial Engineering from the Louisiana Tech University. Mr. Paudel is an embedded consultant at the Office of the Investment Board of Nepal, supporting the project development cell in the office from the last six years. As I welcome Mr. Paudel on stage, 
allow me to share that Mr. Powell will give an introductory presentation outlining the comprehensive project showcase plan for the Nepal Investment Summit 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, please join your hands for Ms. Ranjita Acharya, Masters in Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Hawaii, USA. She's an embedded consultant at the Office of the Investment Board of Nepal, supporting the project development cell in the office for the last five years. She will be giving a presentation on tourism and health sector project. Our next panelist is Mr. Vivek Gupta, MSc in Transportation Engineering, Pulchok, the Triven University. He's an embedded consultant at the Office of the Investment Board, Nepal, supporting the project development cell in the office for about two years. Mr. Gupta will give a presentation on the transportation sector projects. Next is Mr. Narayan Prasad Bhandari. MSc in Urban Planning from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. May I invite Mr. Bhandari up on stage? He is currently working as the Deputy Director General at the Department of Urban Development and Building Construction and holds 27 years of experience. Mr. Bhandari will give a presentation on the Babur Mahal Administrative Plaza project. Mr. Rajendra Kadel. Masters in Economics and Masters in Public Administration from the Thriven University. He's currently working as Acting Director in IDML in the Human Resource and Finance Department for the last 21 years. Mr. Kodil will give a presentation on the Daiji Industrial District Project. May I now invite up on stage Mr. Kim Raj Regmi, MSc in Water Resources Engineering, Thriven University. He's currently working as a hydropower engineer at the Department of Electricity Development for more than eight years. Mr. Regmi will give a presentation on the hydropower projects. Next is Mr. Shankar Shaud, MSc in Water Resources Engineering, Thriven University. He is working as a hydropower engineer at the Department of Electricity Development for more than seven years. He will give a presentation on the hydropower projects. Mr. Santosh Rai, master's degree in engineering management. He is working as the senior officer and project manager at the Alternate Energy Promotion Center, AEPC, and has an experience of 25 years in renewable energy, policy and regulation formulation, energy and budget planning, projects and programs, planning and implementation. Mr. Rai will give a presentation on Karnali Chisapani wind power project. And last but not the least, Ms. Ayushi Koirala, BA LLB Honors, the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences. She's an embedded consultant at the Office of the Investment Board of Nepal, supporting the shared services cell in the office from the last six years. Mr. Ayushi Koirala will give an introductory presentation on investment regime in Nepal. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear a round of applause to our esteemed panelists for this session, which will take you, give you a quick picture on the projects uh, that are showcased for uh, and call for the expression of interest. And uh, regarding the modality, uh, we, I, we shall hand over the floor. Uh, beginning with Mr. Powdell, who will be dealing with the general overview uh, of all the projects and giving us an introductory presentation outlining the comprehensive project showcase plan uh, here at NIS 2024. And then the panelists will take their turns in making their respective uh, presentations. It's my pleasure now to hand over the floor to Mr. Akshit Raj Powdell. All the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, namaste. It fills me with great pride to stand here today and share insights into projects we are presenting on this auspicious occasion. Our discussion today will be structured into three key segments. 
I'll be talking on the first part as setting up the context for today's discussion. Within this section, I shall provide insights on 2017 and 2019 summit. Furthermore, I will introduce IBN Project Bank, which has served as the cornerstone for our meticulous planning in presenting projects today. The remaining parts on the projects and investment process shall be covered by my colleagues later on. Looking back to past summits, Nepal Investment Summit 2017 was organized after a few years of political stability in the country. The main aim of the summit was to showcase favorable investment climate supporting foreign investment. The sectors like energy, aviation, banking, food, railways, road, mining, and manufacturing garnered significant attention on the summit, particularly energy sector drew massive interest on the summit. The summit's success was reflected in the increase in FDI inflows in Nepal, which rose by encouraging 29 percent between the year 2017 and 2018. Likewise, 2019 summit was also an impressive event. At the summit, a total of 77 projects were showcased. The highlight of the event was successful securing of investment interest for 16 of these projects, which are in various stages of study and development. A significant project such as Lower Arun Hydroelectric Project was showcased in this summit, which is now which now is in project implementation stage. As the Investment Board Nepal understands the necessity for ready-to-go projects from past two summits, it was very necessary to establish project bank equipped with comprehensive project notes, feasibility study, detailed project report to appeal to potential investors. Utilizing the COVID regime, and understanding the investor expectation, IVN established IVN Project Bank, that is, depository of credible and bankable projects for public private partnership investment. These projects are selected through predetermined, structured, systematic, and transparent process for identification, selection, ranking, appraisal, and prioritization of the project. Now let's get into the comprehensive plan for presenting project at this summit. Project here are meticulously organized into various categories, each guided by specific criteria endorsed by both technical committee and implementation committee. This committee was established as a result of cabinet decision to orchestrate this year's summit. Firstly, we have project idea dissemination the projects that are featured here are basically in the ideation or conceptual stage. Moving on to the second category, here are projects that are placed for market sounding purpose. Here we'll find little more information on the project showcase project, many of which have already completed pre-feasibility level of study. Tomorrow we'll have a dedicated session on the interest mapping and collecting your feedback on this project. Following the third category, features project showcase for procurement. Those listed projects are based on their level of preparedness. My colleague later on will delve into each project in detail, addressing them individually. In addition to these three categories, there are also projects seeking finance for realization. A few of these are transmission line project and energy sector project, following by agriculture and manufacturing sector. Moreover, there are also projects that are seeking private investment. They are mostly from mining sector, following by manufacturing and tourism sector. We have also showcased projects from both private sector umbrella organization and individual companies. Lastly, 
There is a mixed list of projects. Those are mostly in conceptual stage. After, con after consolidating all the projects, we have got a total of over 150 projects. To be exact, it's 154 in number. They are showcased under various categories. I kindly invite you, each of you to explore the project stall outside. Express your interest. Collect information on the project of your interest. We are here to offer top-notch assistance in every step of the way. On this note, I would like to end my part and would like to invite Ms. Ranjita Acharya, where she will be talking more on ready-to-go projects that have been showcased in this summit. Thank you all for having me here this evening. Namaste. Uh, thank you, Akshit Ji. So, so, as he already mentioned, there are projects in non-energy category and energy category projects. And I'll be talking about some tourism sector projects uh, in the hospitality sector and health uh, tourism sector. So talking about the tourism sector, it represents a significant opportunity for Nepal's economic growth. It is a vibrant sector that not only invites investment but also attracts foreign capital contributing to the country's economy. Pokhara International Convention and Exhibition Center, PICC, project is envisioned to harness our country's tourism potential and boost my tourism. I mean, meeting, incentive, convention, and exhibition tourism. The proposed project is expected to play a key, key role in the economic growth, which will be located in Pokhara metropolitan city, also known as the tourism capital of Nepal, spanning over seven hectares, it will feature an amphitheater, five-star hotel, restaurant, museum, children parks, and many more. This modern state-of-art center is specifically designed to host large-scale mice events. Its establishment is expected to elevate the Pokhara's status as a premier mice tourism destination, attracting diverse range of events and visitors, and contributing significantly to Nepal's tourism and economic development. In Nepal, there is, there is a growing need for large-scale event venues with a complete infrastructure. So our focus is on developing a comprehensive mice ecosystem finely tuned to meet the needs of organizers and participants. This project targets the current gaps in mice venues by offering top-notch facilities tailored to these purposes. Situated strategically between India and China, Nepal offers competitive pricing and taps into substantial demand, particularly from South Asian clients. The venue's proximity to Pokhara's international airport ensures convenient accessibility for international business travelers attending the events. Leveraging Pokhara's reputation as a premier tourism hub with rich natural beauty and cultural heritage and a well-established tourism ecosystem, this project not only meets the demand of modern mice facilities, but also positions Pokhara as a standout destination for memorable and impactful experiences. Our office conducted the pre-feasibility study of this project, and as per the study, estimated project cost is around 30 million US dollars. The study has shown strong financial viability and commercial attractiveness. It presents a profitable investment opportunity and will be executed as a public-private partnership using built, operate, on transfer model with a concession period of 30 years. Another project that is open for UI is Janaki Heritage Hotel and Culture Village project. Our vision for this project is to enhance wedding, cultural, and luxury tourism in Janakpur. This project aims to create a cultural village luxury hotel focusing on destination wedding and other tourism infrastructure to enhance 
the experience of visitors seeking a blend of heritage, culture, and tradition. As we know that Janakpur holds a significant place in Nepal's tourism scene as the birthplace of Sita and a sacred place where Lord Ram and Sita tied the knot. This historical and religious importance makes it an ideal location for developing as a luxury wedding destination. Janakpur has been a preferred wedding destination for many Indian couples for quite some time, and its significance continues to attract many more to, just, to choose this place for their weddings. Additionally, its proximity to Nepal-India border provides easy accessibility for Indian tourists offering cost-effective option. This project is also backed by a thorough pre-feasibility study and appears attractive and financially viable. With careful planning and strategic implementation, it promises strong returns and long-term sustainability. The comprehensive analysis cond conducted indicates that this venture holds significant potential for investors seeking profitable opportunity in the hospitality and tourism sector. Another project in health tourism sector uh, is in health tourism sector and it is Dolikhel Medicity project. This project is designed to be a cutting edge super specialty hospital offering a comprehensive range of healthcare services. It aims to leverage modern technology and medical ex expertise to position Dulikhil as a medical hub for medical tourism. Spanning across more than 13 hectares, it is envisioned as a state-of-art medical center. Dulikhil's natural beauty and serene environment coupled with its proximity to Kathmandu make it an ideal destination for holistic health care. With global demand for medical facilities rising, the proposed project aims to offer comprehensive and high-quality services at competitive prices. Nepal's lower cost of healthcare resources present a significant opportunity to attract medical tourists seeking affordable at high standard treatments. The proposed project is not just about building a hospital. We have envisioned to create a medical hub. Our vision includes a School of Medical Science, Teaching Hospital, Integrative Medical Institute, and so on. Additionally, project aims to tap into wellness care market with a wellness resort complemented by other facilities. As we can see here, the uh, project financial analysis shows favorable financial indicators with the estimated cost of uh, around 19 million US dollar, the project is financially attractive and viable, and this makes it an appealing opportunity for investors looking into sustainable healthcare development. Furthermore, the proposed implementation through PPP modality underscores its commitment to ensuring long-term success and impact in the healthcare sector. Another project that is in uh, medical tourism sector, it's Gautam Buddha Maternity Hospital project in Lumbini. This project also envisions tapping into Lumbini's potential as a hub for medical tourism of offering specialized maternity care in a spiritually enriching environment. By leveraging Lumbini's global recognition and tourism appeal, the project aims to foster international collaboration, promote sustainable health care, practices and boost local economies, creating a holistic and impactful healthcare ecosystem in the heart of Buddha's birthplace. The proposed project aims to establish state-of-art facilities, including, sorry, uh, include, uh, including an antenatal and neonatal care unit services, supporting medical infrastructure, and many more. These facilities are designed to provide comprehensive care of expectant mothers and newborns, ensuring that they receive high standard medical attention and support in a spiritually nurturing environment. Given the increasing demand for maternity facilities, it's, this maternity hospital project aims to meet this demand by offering high-quality healthcare services at affordable prices. This project complements the growing need for comprehensive maternity care, ensuring that expectant mother receive exceptional services that address both their medical and holistic needs. 
This pre-feasibility study uh, has been already completed, and it in indicates that the project, with an estimated cost of 3.6 billion Nepalese rupees, and implemented through the PPP model, is financially viable and attractive for investors. Sorry. Invest, uh, attractive for investors. This study shows that project is feasible and sustainable, demonstrating its potential to deliver high-quality healthcare solution while leveraging Lumbini's appeal as a medical tourism hub. Wrapping it up, these projects are all about being environmentally friendly and sustainable with designs that save energy and reduce carbon emissions. They represent golden opportunities for investors looking into profitable ventures in hospitality and health tourism sector. That concludes my part for now. For now, Vivekji will take over and delve into transportation sector projects. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ranjitaji, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now let me take you all to the transportation-related projects that IBN has been developing. The first one that I'm presenting here is to the Prasim Public Transportation Project. So uh, the basic concept of the project is to enhance the transportation infrastructure in Sudur Prasim province. As you can see, the uh, location mainly covers the Tarai region uh, districts and some hilly areas. As you can see in the map, the red dots are mostly the bus stops that we are planning along the routes. So we have uh, completed a pre-feasibility level study, uh, studying all the routes that are currently in operation and the demand that we saw in the province. Uh, based on those demand and projections, the study has come up with uh, the need for additional 172 buses for the next five years. It includes 68 diesel buses, uh, they will cover some medium routes and some long, two long routes, and 104 electric buses for mostly short and medium routes. So we are uh, trying to electrify the public transportation, uh, you know, the industry in Sudur Pashtim province. So the routes that are identified, there are nine routes, two are long, two medium routes, and five uh, short routes, uh, within the short routes, Tangari Airport to Tangari Bus Park and Tangari Airport to Atariya Bus Park are the new routes. Uh, currently, if you, have, if you are planning to go to Tangari Airport, you have to actually get off at the highway and get a local, uh, you know, the auto ferry to go to the uh, airport. But uh, this study shows that there is a, a potential to viably uh, uh, run the public transportation in this route as well. So there will be five uh, bus terminals as well, Dhangari, Tikapur, Mahindranagar, Dipayal, and Atariya. These bus stops will actually add to the financial viability of the project and provide some more uh, revenue generating avenues for the investors. We have 47 bus stops planned for all these routes within the provinces. Uh, they will provide modern bus stop facilities and as well as provide some grounds for advertisement and again revenue generation for the project. Uh, the commercial areas within the bus terminals will include uh, fuel stations, charging stations, uh, there will be hotels and restaurants, mechanical shops, stores, and washroom and amenities as well. So what we are trying to address is the inefficient uh, transportation system, specifically uh, the lack of uh, proper public transportation system in the province. So it will enhance the mobility and uh, grow, meet the growing need of transportation in the province. Uh, there are unexplored tourism destinations with these uh, routes. The access to these destinations will be more attractive to the people and tourists and definitely the environment-friendly infrastructure that we are building. The energy-efficient bus stops and electric vehicles will add to the uh, sustainability aspect of public transportation in the province as well. So the total estimated cost for the province, the, for the project is around 31.13 billion Nepali rupees. And because it's a public transportation project, we can expect that the return is 2.97% only. So with this, we can see the economic return is very high, above 19%. And for this, uh, the study has actually done a few scenarios of subsidies that might be required to actually make this uh, project viable for the private sector. And one of the recommended scenarios 
is a 25% subsidy in the purchase of vehicles, 10% subsidy in building the bus stops, and interest subsidy of 15%. So we can actually uh, do a better study and come up with uh, uh, better, you know, the numbers and we, that can be negotiated and invested upon. So the idea is to develop the project in PPP model, uh, uh, particularly boot, and the UI for the project is on. So if you are interested, you can uh, meet us at our uh, stall and get more information, and you can also apply for the project. The next one is an expressway project that was envisioned in a uh, tandem of three different project, expressway projects connecting Kathmandu and Chitwan, which I'll be presenting today. And there are other two projects uh, that connect Chitwan to Pokhara and Butwal through expressway. So the idea is to connect all these links to connect the cities within an hour of travel time. As you, uh, most of uh, us from Nepal might have known, it takes around four to five hours to get from Kathmandu to Chitwan, although the road uh, distance is only about 150 kilometers and the expressway that, uh, the route that we have planned, it's only 96.5 kilometers long. So uh, with a speed of 120, 80 to 120 kilometers per hour, it only takes about 57 minutes to get from uh, Chandragiri to Chitwan. So you can imagine uh, actually going to uh, Chitwan and coming back the same day and doing your business works or the vice versa, you can come, anybody from Chitwan can come to Kathmandu and do their official works and go back home in the evening. That is very much more efficient and it not only saves time, but it is particularly more uh, beneficial for the cargo trucks that we see stuck on the very sharp turns and high gradient in the current route, road as well. So this, ha this has a multitude of benefits in terms of uh, minimizing the carbon emissions and you know, saving time as well. So coming down to the financials, so the total cost of the project is 221 billion Nepali rupees, and the internal rate of return that uh, is based on the projections of the traffic is very close to 12%, and the payback period is 11 years, and the benefit cost ratio is 1.3 for the tall only options. And the economic analysis shows there is far more benefit economically for the country and the people as well. So the uh, development modality that, has, that the pre-feasibility study has been recommended is PPP and a hybrid NOD model has been recommended to, so that the government of Nepal can have their stake in development of the project and the private sector would be more uh, comfortable to be on board to develop the project. So to explain more about the next project, uh, we have... Uh, Nayan Prasad Bhandari, sir, from Deputy Director from the Department of Urban Development and Building Construction. Let me hand over to him. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, respected delegates and participants. Uh, I would like to present you this uh, Bormal Administrative Project Plaza. It is a new concept. Uh, uh, that we are presenting to you, that uh, there is a very permanent land in Bower Mall area. It is a three-hectare land under government. And then we are build, constructing, we are proposing uh, half of it uh, to government offices and half of it to the commercial space. Because Bower Mall is the one, one of the area that is centrally located and highly a demandable area for this uh, commercial activities and this uh, government office area. Uh, and all the facilities are available on that area. You, we don't need to go to for, uh, further utility connection and those things all are available there. And uh, the total build-up area is uh, nine, almost uh, 91,000 square meter. Uh, and then half of this area will go to commercial space and half will go to this uh, uh, office, office space, uh, different, uh, there will be a different departments and other uh, offices uh, from different departments and it is that there will be a commercial space as I have already ex explained and it is a uh, differently able friendly design and multi-purpose hall with different facilities as a, for commercial needs. Uh, that uh, its total cost is uh, 10, total 
total cost is uh, 10.91 billion uh, and its IRR is 14.37 percent. Economic EIRR is 16.94 and payback period is 6.4 years and benefit uh, cost ratio is 1.23. That's why it is a uh, investable project in our view. It is an investable project and profitable project. project. And uh, uh, we have our stall uh, on the Department of uh, Urban Development and Building Construction. Uh, we have flares and uh, detailed project reports. All things are there. Uh, you can download our UI from uh, Investment Board's UI and you can apply for UI. Uh, you are welcome to this uh, new concept project and it will be beneficial for government and private sector. It is under boot, uh, <coughs> uh, under PPP and this uh, modality is uh, built, operate and transport modality. Uh, I think this, is, this one is, I am not going to tell you about this, uh, all the technical parts. Uh, you can refer on our UI and all things. Uh, this is our purpose, the space for commercial office on the upper part and uh, space for commercial rent is uh, for uh, lower, lower floors. And I have already said that. Uh, all the things about this uh, commercial uh, com <coughs> financial indicators and we have on, we are completed all the things except this uh, approval of the EIA then it, this is uh, ready to uh, invest project I think this EIA will complete within six to seven months then you can invest within very short period that's why we request you and we invite you to invest on this type of project for nationally or international investor. Both we welcome you uh, and apply. we request you to apply uh, to our UI. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to request uh, Mr. Rajendra Kanel, acting, <coughs> acting Director in IDMC, Department of Human Resource and Finance, to present his projects. Thank you, Mr. Narayan Prasad Bhandari, sir. Uh, me from uh, Industrial District Management Limited, uh, government-owned company, uh, established in 1988. Uh, at present, uh, we have uh, 10 industrial districts are in operation, and seven more industrial districts have been declared by the government of Nepal. Uh, industrial District Management has uh, showcases a uh, project, uh, Daiji Industrial District, who is located uh, in Sudur Pashim province, uh, Kanchanpun district, uh, in Bedgot municipality. Uh, it has a 240.34 hectares area, and uh, total project cost is 9 billion approximately. Uh, yeah, that is in US dollar, 66 million dollar. Uh, total number of uh, industry pro number of plot allocated to the industry is 100 plots. And the plot size is 0.46 hectares to the higher size is 13.64 hectares. The categories of industry as according to the DPR, agro waste industries, mineral waste industries, electrical and electronics industry is the main list. And the estimated uh, employment is 22,000. And current market demand as for the DPR, and the demand for gas is 350 industries has shown their interest. This is our master plan according to the GPR. The AG industrial district has been declared by the decision of the government of Nepal, Council of Ministers, uh, 2016, March 14th. Uh, the project of the digital DPR has been completed 
and environmental impact assessment EIA reported approved. Now the position of the oak using the forest area land for the industrial area in this process. Now the financial indicators. Total project cost is just 8.6 billion. That as I have already said, 9 billion approximately, and US dollar in 65.6 million dollar. Uh, project IRR is a 12.95 and discount rate at the rate of 10 percent. Payback period 22.03, benefit cost ratio 1.29, operating years 30, loan interest rate 10 percent. Although we are offering the in PPP model, public private partnership, that is DBOOT, design, build, own, operation, and transfer period of the 30 years from the data FDA and rent as per the government land lease procedure. Thank you. Uh, I would like to hand over this uh, mic to Mr. Kim Raj Regmi, hydropower engineer from the Department of Electricity Development. Thank you, Rajan sir. So I'm here to present uh, about the hydropower projects which are uh, being studied and uh, under the jurisdiction of the Department of City Development. So, I will present for five projects. Uh, I think uh, the hydropower sector is the sector in which the PPP model is best practiced in Nepal. And I have here five projects. The first project is Umla Karnali uh, hydropower project. This project is of capacity 61 megawatt. And this lies in Umla district. And uh, it will harness the energy of the Humla Karnali River in, it, in its upper ridge, uh, as shown in the slide. You can see that the project total energy is 390 gigawatt hour, out of which about 37% energy is in dry season. And going to the financial part and its cost, the project will cost about 14.6 thousand million uh, in Nepali currency and about 109 million US dollar. Going to its financial factors and parameters, the project IRR is estimated to be about 12 percent, exactly 11.77 percent is, and payback of 11 years and benefit cost ratio of 1.5. One seven. Most of the uh, hydropower projects are being developed uh, in boot model, one of the PPP uh, modalities. And this project is also concept to conceptualized to be built up in boot model also. Going to the projects, uh, status of the project, the project study, feasibility study of the project has been completed in December 2023, and its environmental study also completed in the same date. And the EUI has been published for this project. Going to the next project, this project is Kawadi Khola hydropower project. It is of capacity 30 megawatt. Uh, it is uh, identified in the Kawadi Khola, which is the boarding river of Bajura and Homla district. And its energy is about 185 gigawatt hour. I'm talking about the annual energy. And out of which about 36 percent is energy is, uh, will be in dry, dry months. And about its cost and 
project, project financial factors. The cost is about 6,409 million NRS, which is equivalent to 58.26 million US dollar. And going to its financial uh, IRR, it is about 12.21 percent is an, an attractive one. Talking about the payback period and benefit cost ratio. Payback period is estimated to be 10 years and benefit cost ratio of 1.23. The project, this project is also conceptualized to be built up in boot model. And talking about its status of study, the feasibility study of this project has been completed in 2020 June and the same date for the environmental study. And this project also has been floated for the expression of interest. The next one, Super Budi Gandaki hydropower project of capacity about 35 megawatt, exactly saying 34.93 megawatt. And this project is identified in Budi Gandaki River. It's in its upper ridge. And this project will lie, and uh, uh, this project lies in the Gorkha district. Talking about its energy, annual energy is 183 gigawatt hour, and about 30.35 percentage of energy will be in dry season. About its cost and financial factors, the cost is estimated to be 7,000 million NRS, which is equivalent to 55.54 million US dollar, and its financial indicators. IRR of 12.63 percentage and benefit cost ratio of 1.18. The project is conceptualized with, uh, with the same concept boot model to, de to develop. And about its study status, the project feasibility study has been completed in July, will be completed in July 2024 and estimated its EIA uh, environmental study to be completed in, in the same date. This project also has been in the EOI list. Next is Tom Dogger Buri Gandhi Hydropower Project. It is of capacity 40 megawatt. This project is near to this previous project, Super Buri Gandhi Project. This is also in the upper reach of Buri Gandhi River. And talking about its energy, its energy is about 233 gigawatt hour, out of which 31.5 percent will be in dry season. Its cost and financial indicators, cost will be about 8.7 thousand million NRS, and which is equivalent to 66.49 million US dollar. Its financial indicator, IRR is said to be 12.4 percent, and with equivalent benefit cost ratio 1.23 and payback period of 6.58. The same boot modality has been conceptualized for the development of this project too. Talking about its status of study, its study has also, is estimated to be completed in July 2024, like in Super Buri Gandhi, and the same date has been estimated for the completion of its EIA environmental study. The next one, Upper Samelia Hydropower Project of capacity about 54 megawatt. This is in Darchula district of Sudurpasin province. And this project will have an annual energy generation of 319 gigawatt hour, out of which about 34 percent will be in dry season. Talking about its cost and financial parameters, the cost will be about 11.9 thousand Million, million NRS, and which will be equivalent to 90.3 million US dollar. And its project IRR will be about 12.21 percentage, with equivalent payback period of 6.39 years and benefit cost ratio of 1.31. The same modality boot is conceptualized for the development. 
about its study status. The project study is estimated to be com is completed estimated to be completed in April 2024. It is near date. And about its EIA study, it has been completed in January 2024. All these five projects has been listed in EOI call. You can visit the EOI portal of IBN website, and you can go for this project if you are interested in. Now I will call to call Mr. Sankar South, hydropower engineer from the same organization, Department of Electricity Development, to present for large hydropower projects which are under the jurisdiction of IBN. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Sankar Badur South, hydropower engineer at Department of Electricity Development. So I am going to present the four projects which are uh, studied by Department of Electricity Development, but they are called for UI uh, from IBN because they are of capacity greater than 200 megawatt. The first project is Nomure Multipurpose Project. The combined capacity of the project is 281 megawatt. The project is the storage multipurpose type project. The dam of the project will be constructed uh, in the West Rapi River, 1.5 kilometer downstream of the confluence of uh, Mari and Jimruk River. It will be a 169 meter high CFRT dam. And from uh, that uh, Nomuri storage project, uh, 218 megawatt hydropower will be developed. After that Nomuri uh, storage project, a second hydropower project will be a Lamatal re-regulating hydropower project, which will develop 8 megawatt hydropower. Uh, and after uh, that, the water will be diverted to Kapil Vastu for irrigating approximately 29,000 hectares area uh, for irrigating the area in the Kapil Vastu district. And that project will generate 54.7 uh, megawatt hydropower. So there are three projects in Naumuri Multipurpose Scheme. Naumuri Storage Hydropower Project 218 megawatt, Lamatal Hydropower Project 8 megawatt, which is a re-regulating type project to maintain the flow in West Rath River for irrigation purpose, as well as to divert the flow for irrigation in uh, Kabil Bastu area. And the third one is uh, Sur uh, Surainaga Hydropower Project, which is diversion from West Rathi to the Kabil Bastu to generate uh, 54.7 megawatt hydropower uh, capacity. The total energy from all three hydropower projects is 1275.71 uh, gigawatt hour. It is the annual saleable energy after deduction of all uh, outages from the project, and out of that, the uh, wet season energy is 61.24 percent, and dry season energy is 38.76 percent. This energy can even be increased because uh, in Nepal, uh, while planning for storage hydropower projects, we uh, generally focus on the dry season energy because in the wet season, you can we can even supply the load from ROR projects. Uh, so our criteria uh, by NEA for PPA is that a project must qualify 35% dry energy criteria, which limits the wet season energy. So uh, if we can manage the market uh, for uh, energy cell outside the country, like in India or any uh, neighboring countries, we can increase the energies if, even more than that. So uh, a financial analysis of the project also was conducted. Uh, and uh, the financial analysis shows that uh, the project cost is approximately 125 billion Nepalese rupees. The financial analysis was conducted at a soft loan of 2% uh, interest rate with debt equity ratio of 70-30. And it shows that the project IRR is 9.49%, which is uh, marginally feasible. Uh, the economic IRR is 10.446, which shows that the project is economically feasible. The financially, the project is marginally feasible. The benefit cost ratio is 1.31, and debt service coverage ratio is 1.31. Uh, 
Uh, the project, uh, the pre-feasibility study of the project was conducted by multiple organizations and finally DOAD conducted the feasibility stu study which was completed back in June 2022 and EIA uh, was also completed uh, in June 2022. So the project is called for EY by uh, IVN and uh, about uh, uh, the development progress of the project. Uh, Department of Electricity Development, uh, uh, Development has already uh, uh, set up the office for the project and started the pre-construction activities. Uh, the pre-construction activities are already being constructed by DOAD. The project is, has already uh, initiated its uh, uh, construction stage. The next project is Khemti uh, Tose Sivale Hydrobar project of 1216 megawatt capacity. Uh, the uh, prominent features of the project is that it is basically uh, designed uh, to uh, generate energy in dry season, prominently in dry season. As you can see from the energy table, 94% of the energy will be generated in dry season. Uh, this project is uh, planned considering the load deficiency uh, in dry season in our energy system. So 94% of the energy will be uh, generated in dry season and 5.92% uh, approximately 6% will be generated in wet season. So the project is uh, proposed in the Kimti River. Uh, it will uh, be developed with a, a concrete dam of, of approximately 280 meter high concrete dam. And uh, the capacity will be uh, 1216 megawatt and the annual energy generation is 1411.35 uh, gigawatt hour. So uh, according to the uh, interim design report or uh, interim level study of the project, the cost of the project is 289 billion Nepalese rupees, uh, which is equivalent to 21.86 uh, uh, million US dollar. The payback period of the project is slightly higher, uh, 19.31 uh, years, and economic IRR from the project is 12.15%. So the project uh, feasibility study of the project is ongoing. Uh, the interim level design is completed. And uh, the feasibility and EIA of the project is expected to be completed in uh, September 2024. And uh, uh, at the same date, uh, EIA and feasibility will be uh, is estimated to be completed. So basically, uh, uh, this project uh, is uh, 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 necessary for our energy system because it will generate energy in the dry season. Uh, most of the energy will be generated in the dry season. So it is important in our context because it will reduce the energy import from India. The another project is Kalinga Degi 2 storage hydro power project. It was identified by uh, Gondak Basin Master Plan in 1979. And after that, uh, DOED is conducting feasibility study of the project. This project consists of a 155-meter-high CFRT dam. Uh, it is proposed to be constructed with CFRT dam of 155-meter height. And the dam will be located approximately uh, 25 kilometer upstream of uh, the Devgat in Kalingandagi River. It will, the dam will be constructed in the Kalingandagi River. And the power house will be constructed at the dam too. The project will generate 650 megawatt uh, uh, capacity uh, with total annual energy of 3, uh, 3, 2, 94.62 gigawatt hour. The project will generate uh, 35.57, approximately 36% energy in dry season, whereas 64.43% energy in wet season. Uh, the same uh, scenario is in this project also. So to, uh, to, uh, uh, if we, we can uh, explore the uh, power export market in neighboring countries, we can uh, even increase the annual energy generation. Uh, that, that can be even more than 3,294.62 gigawatt hour. The estimated pro cost of the project is only 33 billion uh, Nepalese rupees. Uh, and as for financial analysis of the project, the IRR of the project is estimated to be 9.7%. Uh, it is uh, where it is marginally feasible. Benefit cost ratio is 1.09. Debt equity ratio is assumed to be 70 is to 30. 70% debt and 30% equity. And debt service coverage ratio is 1.45. Uh, uh, the 
uh, feasibility and EIA study is ongoing and is estimated to be completed by uh, April 2025. The next project uh, is a Varvang storage hydropower project, which is, uh, which is proposed to be constructed in Tuliberi River, uh, and the project location lies in Dualpa district. Uh, it is approximately uh, 28 kilometers uh, away from uh, Dunai Bazar, uh, the nearest marketed Dunai Bazar. So the project will uh, generate 337.1 uh, uh, megawatt hydropower, uh, and the annual energy generation from the project is 943.9 uh, gigawatt hour. The prominent feature of the project is uh, the dry energy and wet energy are almost, uh, almost the same, so uh, this uh, project is also uh, considered to uh, supplement the dry energy gap in our power system. So, uh, and the financial analysis of the project is also conducted. We saw that the project cost is uh, uh, 71 billion Nepalese rupees, uh, and uh, financial internal rate of return uh, IRR of the project is 10.5 percent. The project is uh, uh, financially feasible with benefit cost ratio 1.06. Uh, and debt equity ratio assumed for the project is 7 is to 30. The feasibility study of the project is ongoing, uh, uh, and uh, the feasibility study and EIA study are expected to be completed by uh, July 2024. Uh, so, uh, thank you, gentlemen. So, uh, uh, for the uh, next uh, presentation, uh, I would like to request uh, Mr. Santos Rai, Senior of Officer and Project Manager, Alternative Energy Promotion Center. Thank you very much. Namaste and very good evening to all of you who are present here with this August gathering with us today. Um, I'm representing Alternative Energy Promotion Center, which is a government focal agency for renewable energy and energy efficiency in Nepal uh, under Ministry of Energy, Water Resources and Irrigation. So today I am presenting you uh, a, a different project, a wind power project here. The government of Nepal has um, published uh, its expression of interest EOI today itself with the aspiration to receive uh, interesting proposals uh, from the investors who are present here, probably uh, the national as well as the international uh, investors, potential investors indeed. So to begin with, so this project uh, lies uh, in the Sudur Pashim province in the western part of Nepal. Um, uh, the project site uh, locates uh, nearby the Karnali Bridge uh, on the Karnali River on, alongside the um, East-West Highway. It is actually 500 kilometers away from Kathmandu if you travel by vehicle. And alternatively, we can travel by um, air route also, by air. We have to take a one hour flight from Kathmandu to Nepalgans, then it is 90 kilometers away from Nepalgans airport. So here, our idea is uh, to showcase this uh, new idea among the potential investors to open the avenue for harnessing wind potential in Nepal. As we all know that we have already harnessed uh, uh, solar potential here in Nepal. Hydropower is the most uh, uh, potential of the energy resources, clean energy sources of Nepal. We have already harnessed a lot of hydropower potential in Nepal. We have um, completed few solar projects already, and this will be the first wind project here in Nepal, which will be grid connected one. We have done small projects, but we have not done uh, grid connected wind projects yet. So if you see the financial indicators, this might not be attractive to you for the potential investors because uh, to begin with, the government of Nepal has offered with this um, initial offering to you, um, which shows uh, um, not much attractive in my understanding, in my perception, not much attractive to the financial uh, perspective, but it can be uh, very attractive if you see with the um, economic uh, perception, with the lens of economic um, uh, feasibility, and also with the social and environmental benefits. 
the government of Nepal wishes to uh, do this project uh, with the public-private partnership approach, uh, partnering with the potential invest investors and, uh, if possible, with the development partners. Here, our idea is to uh, do this project, implement this project with the public-private partnership, with the funding from uh, the uh, leveraging fund from the private sector, uh, along with the uh, interest uh, buy-down, interest subsidy from the government side. It's in rivers? Down? Not working? This one? Okay, thank you. Sorry. So with this, I hereby request uh, uh, the potential investors, the distinguished guests uh, who would be interested to join hands together with the government of Nepal, please come up with your uh, proposals. Uh, uh, for initial offering, we have come up with these uh, offerings, but I hope we can negotiate, with, you can negotiate with the government of Nepal to make it a feasible project to implement later. So thank you all for hearing. I hereby now uh, um, uh, invite Ayushi Koirala, who is uh, representing IVN, Investment World Nepal. Thank you all. Namaste everyone. Uh, I'll be very quick with my presentation. Today I'll be talking about uh, um, relevant laws governing investment. So, um, so, the, uh, so we have, so let me just get to the presentation. So here's a list of laws that regulate uh, investment in Nepal. Uh, so I'm gonna, uh, so, so there's Foreign Investment and Technology Transfer Act, and there's Public-Private Partnership in, and Investment Act, Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, and um, there's the Company Act, Income Tax Act, Labor Act, and there are also other sectoral acts. Also there's Environment Protection Act. These are major acts governing, uh, regulating investment in Nepal. Um, and so, Investment, so the word investment, what does it mean? So where all can you invest, how can you invest? So investment can be done in shares, loan, technology transfer, uh, lease finance, and uh, there's also a provision for expand, establishment and expansion of branch and venture capital fund, and others are as specified in the relevant laws. So moving on to my next slide. So there, there's a list of, um, uh, there's a list of restrictions on foreign investment where um, um, uh, uh, certain industries and businesses have been restricted and they've been listed out, such as uh, poultry farming, personal service business, uh, industry producing arms and ammunition, and other similar uh, substances and materials, real estate business, uh, travel agency involved in tourism, publication, media house, and uh, there's also uh, um, educational consultancy. I think uh, this has some exception. Uh, so um, I think the, uh, we're done here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a good evening.
Uh, thank you all for being here with us today. And by this, uh, our presentation ends. So I would like to uh, invite you all to join the stall outside and gather information on the project. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much, especially to this uh, to this pool of expert. Ms. I see if you could join in one more time for a quick group photograph again. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our pool of experts for running us through uh, the central highlight of this entire summit. I'm sure you would have queries, questions, and comments to make on this. The secretariat uh, is more than welcome to entertain all of those at any point of time. Uh, for the moment, uh, I think we should call it a day. Uh, it's been a pretty, pretty long day today. Uh, to the experts, thank you so much. And also to the members in the audience, thank you for your kind attention and for uh, your patience. So tomorrow is going to be your fresh uh, and a new day, wherein we'll be part of um, almost 12 sessions and side, line, uh, side events. Uh, big, we will be beginning at 10.10 10 a.m. right here at this very particular venue. The sessions will be split into four and will be running four sessions parallelly. So you might want to come a little earlier, maybe around 9.30 to find the session of uh, the panel of your choice and enroll yourself uh, to, uh, to it. So 10 a.m. is where we begin the panel tomorrow. Uh, we expect you at least by 9.30 just to run through what's going on around and also please do not forget to uh, run through uh, the uh, stalls, more than 20 plus stalls that is uh, put up outside. For today, one more time, thank you very much. Uh, we will now be meeting at the networking dinner at this very venue. So until we see you tomorrow, have an enjoyable evening. Thank you for being a great 